All right, so today we are here chatting with Kara Goucher. Kara probably does not need any sort of introduction. I think most people know you at this point, um, but we're really excited to have you on the show to chat about your new book and just life in general. I mean, would you say Kara kicked off the modern age of women's distance running in the marathon? Like, For sure. I feel like she's the the new guard. Well, thanks. <laughs> so, yeah, welcome to the show, Kara. I like that. Sure. All right. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to you guys. Um, before I, we dive into wait, the can, book. Can we go back to New York? What happened in New York? Well, the first time we met Kara. Mm. And uh, it was one of my best days. I got to meet Kara. I got to meet Meb. Emma Coburn was there, even though I didn't know who she was. And Meg took a picture of me with her. And I was like, later on, she explained <laughs> who she was. And I was like, oh, I should have been nicer. Um, but um, we took pictures with Kara. We took pictures with Meb. I'm on a high. It's the first time I met Ginger Runner in person. We're at the Sketchers party. And I'm going through Kara's new book. And it was one of the saddest days of her life. Like, it was a bad day that she wrote about in the book. And I'm like... That was my high <laughs> for you, for Kara. It was not a great day. Uh, do you remember that day? Well, after I'm glad you had fun. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, was that in 2014? That yeah. That happened in 2014. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a rough, rough day for me. I was thinking about quitting the sport that day, but I'm glad that you had fun. Yeah. Like that's, a, but you think about that, the juxtaposition of, we don't know what the other person's going through. When I saw you, you looked fantastic. I knew you didn't have the day that you wanted to have in New York. But you're still like, to me, I'm like, wow, that's, look at this. This is Kara Gesher, one of the, the greatest of all time. And you're there probably like thinking about <laughs> retiring. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That was a really rough race for me. And I just felt like I had moved my family across the country. I had convinced Mark Wetmore and Heather Burroughs to coach me. And I was kind of like, why am I, why am I wasting everybody's time? Um, and in the book, you know, like Mark and Heather were like, no, no, you still have more. We believe in you. Um, but I was definitely like questioning, what am I doing? Like, why am I getting all these people involved anymore? Like, maybe it's just done. I mean, everyone's career ends at some point. Like, maybe this is just it. Mm. That's got to be a scary feeling. All right, let's bring it back to Doesn't some fun now. <laughs> now. I brought it all the way down. Yeah, that would that still again for quickly. me. Great day, great day. <laughs> I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Yeah, <laughs> we'll get back into that stuff. All right, Meg, where were you going to go to start it off just before, before I derail this? Yeah, before we dive into your book and some of that, um, you were just on vacay in Hawaii with your family. How was that? It was so great. It was so great, and like it was funny because we didn't know how the book would do, and so I told. My publisher, like, I'm going to Hawaii for a week. I don't want to talk about the book. I don't want to do anything while I'm there. And this was, you know, a couple months before it was out. And they're like, that shouldn't be a problem. And then the book was successful that first week. And they were like, are you, like, are you sure you have to go to Hawaii? And I was <laughs> like, yes, I told you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was really great. Like, we just don't do anything. We, like, swim in the ocean for a couple hours, have lunch, throw the football in the pool for a couple hours. Like, we... we are always the last to close out at the beach and stuff. So everyone's like, what'd you do? Where'd you go? And I'm like, to the beach. But it was great. <laughs> I mean, that's got to be great since most of your vacations up until now, probably most of your time, even with the family, it had to do with something with running, whether it was, you know, it, they weren't vacation vacations. Yeah, this is only our third family vacation we've taken, which was not like a day added on due to some running trip. So um, we're trying to prioritize it. We did it in 2019 and we couldn't believe like it was the first time we had ever taken a family trip that wasn't associated with running. Um, and then, of course, COVID for a couple of years. And then we did it again last year and this year. I think we're going to have to go somewhere cheaper because we can't afford to keep <laughs> these vacations. But I think we've made that a priority to spend time together and decompress and not work and not worry about training, things like that. Yeah. I mean, the book should help with taking vacations. I mean, both of you got two purchases here because Megan got the one that you have to look at with your eyes and I got the one that you get to listen to with your ears. So Oh good, thanks guys. You got, you got two two sales here. Were you actually able to like totally check out there knowing that I mean you had just released this book and I mean there's probably like exciting things happening. Yeah, I mean, I, I checked my email every day. I talked to the publisher every day. I did do one interview while I was there just because it was gonna run that Sunday in the New York Times. Um, so it felt like, well, that's kind of a big deal. I should probably <laughs> do that. But um, everything else, I, I yeah, I just would check in in the morning and make sure there wasn't anything urgent. And then, yeah, I just 
like was just out, just read my book Spare that I had started a million times but hadn't finished and finally read it. And um, Adam and I both have sore arms from throwing the football with our son, which is pretty embarrassing, but <laughs> it was great. Yeah. Well, you guys are used to using your legs more. Yeah. The, um, <laughs> when, it, when it comes to the book, though, like a lot of people read on the beach. A lot of people are reading in airports. Did you catch anybody reading your book or did you see it in anybody's? Uh, that? No. And you know, my son was so excited. He's like, we're going to find someone reading your book. But no, we didn't see anyone reading it, which uh. is probably good because then they'd want to talk about it and then it would, uh-huh. and, which is fine. But then it would have felt like, oh, I'm breaking my no work rule. Yeah. So. I mean, you could just, you lower your sunglasses and wear the wide brim hat and just keep walking. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Carmen San Diego. <laughs> There we go. Where in the world? Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> um, so also not really related to the book, but you're running recently. Um, you mentioned that you were diagnosed with runner's dysto. Am I saying that? Dystonia? Yep. Um, what is the latest with that? And how is your running going? It's not great. Um, I've been get. I was on medication for a long time, uh, Parkinson's medication that was really helping me, but it was causing other side effects. Like I was, one of the main side effects is brain fog and the inability to come up with words. And like part of my life is talking on a hot mic. Um, so I had to come off of that and I, I feel like I'm not as stable as I was. Um, but I'm still, I am running. I just, I still feel really uneasy on pavement I mostly run on my treadmill. I do, there's a couple crushed gravel paths here in Boulder that I'll drive to. So, I mean, I'm hoping that I can get to a point where I can run from my door. Um, This past fall, I was, had an amazing stretch and I was helping a friend who was getting ready for New York and I did like a 17 mile run and I was like, oh my gosh, like between this small medication dose and the Botox, like I'm back. And then I must have pushed you far because then I'll like within a week I was having troubles walking. So mm. I don't know what it's going to look like in the future, but right now I'm, I'm like just trying to be grateful for four or five miles a day and, and you know, but you were runners. So I'm always going to like keep pushing yeah. and seeing what I yeah. can get. Have you found something that gives you some form of satisfaction like running that you've been able to substitute in or is it still like, no. I got, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying like to give myself some to- hope. <laughs> You know, I love running so much. I love I love the impact of the ground. It makes me feel like alive. And so, yeah, everyone's like, I've tried cycling. I've tried swimming. Um, I tried to get back into Nordic skiing a little bit, but my dystonia really affects that, my glide on my mm. left leg. Um, I have a friend who's like taking me rock climbing. And I mean, I'll do whatever people invite me to do, but I really just, I really just want to go for a run. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we hope that that just continues to get better. And I'm, I mean... It is crazy. I had never even heard of this um, before. Oh, me neither. Okay. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> yeah. one of those things. I think you, I, you're probably their biggest advocate at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, look, I, I hate that I have it, but I'm glad that I bring an awareness to it because it, I think it is more common than we think. I think most people are just like, I don't know what's going on with my leg. Like I'm just going to move on to another sport or quit running or whatever. Um, so I, that, that part of it's good. I, I've met a lot of really cool people who have it and I had no idea. I think it's a lot more common than we think. Well, um, you know, maybe we should, but, I'm, I'm an era, sorry to interrupt you real quick here. Maybe we should kind of tell people what it is. Cause I don't know that people understand. I don't even understand what it is Yeah, really. Can you, can yeah. you just give a little? Yes. All right. So when the doctor first told me I had focal dystonia and it was expressing itself when I was running, I was like, well, what is that? Like, I had no idea what he was talking about. I had never heard of it. Um, And as we were driving home from the appointment, I was like Googling it. And even I was I was Googling like runner's dystopia. But I finally found this article in Runner's World and... I started to read it and I was like, oh, no, that does sound like me. But essentially, they don't know why it happens. Um, it happens to musicians a lot. It happens to writers, people who use, who have a repetitive movement. It's also called repetitive movement dystonia. And somehow the brain wires get crossed and there's no one doing it. Um, some people have had a lot of success, like getting deep brain implants. Um, wow. I haven't gone that route yet. I would consider it in the future. Uh, but essentially the brain wires get crossed. And so when you go to do that movement, whether it's like an artist thing or a running, your all of your muscles just fire at once. And so you mm. lose complete control of your legs. So for me, it felt like 
I, I couldn't tell that my foot was landing on the ground. I couldn't feel that impact coming up through my leg. And so I felt like I was falling and slipping. And, and it was so real that I, I fell multiple times, even though my foot was landing on the ground. Um, and so the most common form of treatment is Botox. And they do that because it cuts that signal. So when your brain sends the signal to fire, um, it can't because it's dead because you put Botox in yeah. it which is great, but it is kind of just like a band-aid because then your muscles are getting weaker and you lose control of them. So, so where you know, are they in putting an the ideal Botox? World, they're putting it, so for me, they're putting it in like my calf and in my posterior tib um, because my foot flexes in and so that helps it be more neutral. But it's different for everybody depending on where you are. The one thing I would say is don't just let a doctor start putting Botox all over your body. Do it the painful way where they, they have an EMG so there's a needle listening to your muscles. So with the EMG, if you flex your foot or whatever body part, you can hear it. You can hear the muscle firing. And if you don't have dystonia, when they say relax, it goes quiet. And so that's the best way to have it placed because they know exactly where it is. Like when she says push, you hear it. When she says relax it, you still keep hearing it. And that's where she's like, okay, you have the youngest looking leg out there. <laughs> so, um, you know, but it is sort of a Band-Aid solution. And um, I'm working with a couple new physical therapists and hope long term I can get enough control and strength that I won't have to do that. But hey, if I have to get Botox four times a year to run four miles a day, I'll, I'll do it. Yeah. Plus sure. your leg will look young and fresh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, that's amazing. It's like so young looking. No smile lines on it. <laughs> no great. wrinkles whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, so now that your book has been out for a few weeks now, um, what were you expecting the response to be and versus what you got? And are you happy with how it's all gone? Yeah, I was really nervous the night before it came out. I felt like I was sharing a lot of really, really personal things and I didn't know if people would... You know, I've lived for so long with people saying I'm a liar that I didn't know if that would be the reaction to the book as well. But the morning that it came out, I just felt super calm. Um, and like, I actually am like a huge jaw clencher and like my jaw has been great since it came out. So <laughs> I didn't go looking for negativity. You know, like I know the site's not to go on. I know not to read comments. But for me, it's been overwhelmingly positive. And um, there's been a lot of interest, but there's also just been a lot of people reaching out with their own stories that are very similar, sadly. So I think... I thought it was going to be, even when I was doing the article for People Magazine, they were like, you know they're going to come after you, right? And I was like, great. Um, but I haven't really felt that. I've had a few people, yeah. But in general, it's been really, really positive, which has made me really happy because yeah. I, I thought it would be more 50-50 because that's how it's been in the past. I mean, I have to say going into the book, I, I didn't read your People Magazine article. There's two, like, I kind of saw you from the fan's point of view. So I watched your career. I watched your running. I didn't really get involved in the side show stuff that was going on. The only time, uh, I guess it was like 2016 when you were running the trials, I saw you break down after the, um, on the Let's Run interview. Uh, I remember we were, we were running a marathon the next day. So we watched the trials to kind of get pumped up. And I saw you, like, kind of break down uh, after that and, and for good reason, but we'll get into that in a sec. And I was like, Oh, that's a different Kara than I've been following or thinking. Like I had my own perception of who and what you were as a runner and going into the book, I felt like, okay, I'm going in. I don't have a dog in this fight. Just want to read this and, and listen to it and see what she has to say. I have to say I was, shocked at how intimate and open you were throughout the book uh, on all the topics. And it, it was kind of like an eye opener and kind of creating a three dimensional person rather than a two dimensional, uh, like athlete that I looked up to and, and going through it, I'm wondering you're, you're basically walk us step by step on how you went into this psychological, uh, relationship with uh, Salazar and I'm thinking this is probably the person she wants to get furthest away from in her life would love to probably just move past this do you feel like the book now though is actually intertwined you guys so tightly that you can't really say Salazar without thinking Kara Goucher 
That's a great question. I don't feel that way. Um, I felt like that way for most of my career, but I think this was the final step for me of like really moving on. Um, and, and also just like reclaiming my own voice because so many people, so many effing people have talked about me without knowing me or ever being on the team or ever even meeting me some people. And so I felt like if I could just put it all together, then, then I can move on. Like those articles aren't going to bother me anymore. Those, those comments aren't going to bother me anymore. And I also was really dedicated when I was you know, talking to potential publishers that I was going to tell it all. Um, Everything had to be on the table or it wasn't worth doing. Like I didn't want to do it. And then, and then years later be like, wow, I wish I had really shared like what truly happened or I wish I had shared the hard times or whatever. And my co-author Mary Pallon was very much the same way. Like we either tell it all and the stuff that doesn't make you look good and the stuff that is really hard to read or we don't bother. And so she really, that's what I wanted, but I also needed her to really hold me to that throughout the process in the book it kind of does like a slow trickle so like when i first hear you start saying stuff and reliving yourself obviously you give the background of you growing up some of the trauma that you had growing up i don't want to tell the whole book but go ahead read the book (laughs) and um you kind of slowly slide into the things that you end up discussing Or is it intentional to show that slow, one step at a time, how someone can become in a situation like you ended up in? Yeah, I felt like it was important. Like if you don't know how I grew up or if you don't know some of the things that I had experienced, you might be like, well, she's just dumb or you know what I mean? But I think that's what it takes is like understanding each other as humans and um you know, I, because of my childhood and because of things that I had lived through, I, I've always really, really relied on my coaches. And this was re- with Alberto, it was so much more than a coach. And it was, it felt to me like this was supposed to be like, I was supposed to meet him. He's going to fill this role and take me to the highest levels. But I felt like it was for sure important that you got that background because otherwise it just looks like, like I'm just dumb. Well, you know I, what I mean? Like you have to understand me to understand how it could happen. I don't think dumb would be the right way to put it, but I do see like, I, I remember not having read your book and seeing like some of the stuff that Mary Kane was going through. I was kind of like, but isn't this just what you expect when you go to get coached? by like these people know Nike, they know Salazar. And if you sign up for this, isn't this what you're signing up for? And reading your book really opened my eyes to, the complexity of like almost grooming, like, um, you know, it's not an, like you come there and they hand you a handful of needles and, uh, you know, some crazy stuff that you're like, nah, I'm not into this. That there's like a slow kind of like bringing you into the family, making you feel welcome, making you feel important. And then that's when like maybe some things that could, I mean, I, I don't want to say could be considered abuse, <laughs> It, it was abuse. Um, do, you, in, do you see it back that way? Like that that's how it went down? Yeah, it's, it's hard for me to think that the grooming is a word that was used a lot by lawyers and um, psychologists and stuff. I, 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 it, it's hard for me to think that it was that calculated, um, but also the person that I thought Alberta was turned out to not be real. So I don't really know. I will say looking back, it was, you know, I just want to yell at myself and be like, that's a sign. That's a sign. (laughs) Red flag. Wave it, wave it, you know. But at the time it was like, I'm living the dream. I'm training. I get whatever I want. I have the best coach in the world. I have the best facilities. I get to go to altitude. I have the best equipment. Like, so what if he's a little weird? So what if he's a little handsy? So what if, you know, like, nothing's perfect. And, and I, I really felt so long, just so lucky to be there. And so you just sort of start to justify it. Sure. When you look back and it's all over, you look back and you're like, uh, the, you were like constantly avoiding landmines, you know, but I, at the time I, I really did not feel that way. And you're also at that time, how old? 21? Well, that's, 
part of it. No, no, no. I wasn't young. Um, so let's see. I graduated when I was 22 and I stayed with Wetmore for three years. So I was 20, what year? 25, 26 when we moved out there. And I think that's part of the embarrassment shame piece, which I've worked through. I'm not embarrassed or ashamed anymore, but I can still feel it. I can still like feel how that was, is that I wasn't a young kid right out of college and I didn't go alone. Like my husband was there the whole time. And there's a part of that that's, it's just embarrassing, you know, but that's why it's also important to tell because it can happen to anyone. Um, it doesn't mean, it doesn't just happen to young girls and young women. It can happen anywhere and at any time. Now that you've been through this, um, if there is someone that's going through what you were going through when, when you were at Nike, like what is your advice to that? And like, what, what would you recommend they do? It's really hard because right now the only real system is going to safe sport. And that means you have to go to them and you have to tell them what happened to you. And then you go through this whole process of them investigating, then they make a decision and then the person can appeal it. And then you have like, like a trial, like with witnesses and evidence and stuff. And that's really, really hard to go through. So while I, I'm thankful for safe sport and the fact that they did ban him for life, it's really hard to ask someone to go and make that call. Um, I, you know, I would love to see a third party, like, just like we have USADA that's checking in with the athletes quarterly or twice a year where you have to meet with them for however many minutes that's not associated with any sponsorship that's not associated, you know, with any funding that goes towards running. But I think, I think that like, you should trust your gut. And if something's wrong, you should start to you know, think about where you can go to talk to someone and maybe it's someone from that's not in your group at all. Heck, maybe it's me, right? But maybe it's someone totally outside of your training group and that's okay, but you need to get perspective from someone else. And then, I mean, I, the bottom line is no one should feel like that. No one should feel like they don't have a choice. No one should feel like they're stuck. No one should feel like they have to deal with certain things because otherwise they'll lose everything. Um, it's just a tough place to be. And what's weird is you had, or you felt like you had at the time, someone at Nike who was supposed to be there for your mental health, for uh, being a sounding board, being someone that you could trust to express some of the feelings that you have, not just about uh, your coach, but just life in general. And it turns out he wasn't... <laughs> I mean, he was doing the exact thing that you trust a therapist not to do, which was divulging information to third parties. Right. Like, yeah, so I had worked with sports psychologists for years, right? But actual people with a psychology degree. When Darren Treasure came in, we were told we had to work with him. And I, I kind of liked him at first. Like he was to the point. Um, but, you know, I am a person who like my happiness is intertwined with how I'm running. And if I was struggling with anything with Adam or with Alberto, you know, like I, th I thought that was a safe place to say all those things. But no, it would come back to me. Alberto would say, like, why are you telling Darren you're afraid of this? Or why are you telling Darren you're questioning this? And and then you're kind of in this catch 22 because you still have to talk to Darren to stay on the team. But, you mm. know, now you can't trust him with like the things that are really bothering you and the things that are really potentially affecting your running. So yeah, it's just, it was, it was tough. Has that changed how you trust people in general? Like I would think that especially in a situation like that, where you're sharing intimate feelings, stories, whatever, and expecting them to have, uh, I don't, it's not even like a Hippocratic oath or anything. It's a, just a confidentiality agreement with most therapists. It, did that end up leaving a mark? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, like, I am just a trusting person by nature. I just feel like most people are good. But I've definitely been jaded by all of this. And sometimes it, I'm embarrassed about it. Like, even when I joined NBC, I just assumed all the men were going to be douches. And they were all, like, so nice to me. So <laughs> it's like, I just have this, like expectation that you're going to let me down and that's not good either and that's something that I've worked through too because like especially when I joined the team at NBC I just was telling my therapist I know they're going to hate me they're going to talk down to me and treat me and none of not a single person has done that to me um, but I think that that's just a, a consequence of trusting and being let down so many times that now I like kind of have this wall and I, I don't like that actually that's not who I am at my core 
I mean, Meg, you, we watched the coverage of some of Worlds. We were at Worlds, so we got a first hand of it. Yeah. But we watched it, and I saw where you put your ponytail and <laughs> 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 and everything. But uh, I thought you did a great job. Is that is that um, a, is that where you want your career to go? I don't know. I don't think like. Um I like it. It's fun. It makes me feel like I have purpose. It it helps me stay connected to the sport. But um, I would I wouldn't want to only do that. There's a lot of other things that I'm passionate about. But I have really enjoyed the job, and I'm glad I got the opportunity. And I really love the team I work with. Like I get super excited to go. The first year I was always nervous. I hated going to Eugene. I would cry in my hotel room. Um, and now I feel like I'm really close with everyone there. I feel like I've sort of reclaimed Eugene as a place where I can go and be safe and be happy. Um, and I just have so much fun. So will I be doing it forever? I don't know, but I'll, I'll do it as long as they'll have me probably. Red. Um, Thomas brought up the 2016 trials, which I know was obviously not your favorite day. But I'm really curious because that's sort of the first time that we um, were introduced to the super shoes. And you had left Nike at this point. But when you were with Nike, was that ever a conversation? Like, were you ever in development um, with the shoes or knowing anything about that they were coming or in the works? No, I knew nothing about it. Hmm. Yeah. So like on that day, I had no idea. Like, I, I had never heard anything about the shoe. Um, and even on that day, I didn't know about it. You know, it was, I didn't find out about it till later. What was, I mean, obviously you were distraught about it, but like, what was your initial thought when you hear that there was this shoe that you didn't have access to? Or technology. Um, yeah. To be totally honest, I thought that everyone was lying. I was like, how could a shoe, like people started to talk to me, people that were involved in the study at CU actually started to talk to me and they were like, I think you might have like, it might have cost you an Olympic spot. And I was like, what? No, a shoe, come on, <laughs> you know? Um, and so at first I was just like, that's, no, that's that, like, that didn't happen. Um, but then as it went on and I started to read the research and then like I was actually shown some of the research, I, I was... I'm not an angry person, but I was, and I wasn't angry at the athletes specifically, but I was very angry because I felt like the shoe we know now is a huge game changer. I mean, look at, there's not a single record left, right? So we, you know, we know that now, but at the time we, we didn't, and only a few people had it. And so I was really angry. I thought like this, like, I have to deal with people who are doping and now I have to deal with this, you know, <laughs> like it's just never ending. And so, and I just felt like it was very unethical and that it broke rules at the time. Um, and it was hard. It was really hard because it made me feel like, well, should I be a three-time Olympian? I mean, I, that's the thing, even when you race someone who's doping, you don't know. And again, I wasn't mad at anyone specifically. I was pretty mad at Nike, <laughs> but I just felt anger. Like, I cannot believe that that happened. I cannot believe that this technology was being used that I didn't even know about, that no one knew about, and that it it made a difference. It undoubtedly it made a difference. I might have still been fourth, but it it made a difference. Yeah, that was a rough day. That was just hot. how do you do? You, were you do you feel like those type of weather conditions hot like that? It was in Los Angeles. Are you do you do well in those conditions, or do you feel like that was also something that played into your performance for the day? Um. I think everybody has is dealt the same cards, right? So I don't think that it hurt my performance. I actually think I ran a great race. I definitely faded the last couple miles, but I, I've never gone and looked at the splits. My coach has them, but I was like, I don't want to see them. Because <laughs> I, I just was feeling sorry for myself, really. I really wanted to drop out. I was like, this is like my worst nightmare. Like if it had been like New York where you and I met, I'd be like, this is a definite answer from God that you should not be racing anymore, that your time is done. Mm. But to be fourth is so close. And then you think, well, well, should I hang on there? Like there's two more world championship teams coming up. And, um, so when I was running those last couple of miles, I just was devastated. And you know, that the hope of that had gotten me through so much. And I knew that it, as soon as I crossed the finish line, it was just over. So, but, but you're still I, an I alternate like I, at that point, right? 
Yeah, but we all know that doesn't mean anything. You know? I don't know what it's marathon. Like, no, you're the alternate. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, know, in I'm the like, book, you whatever. talk about a time that you got a nice break for being an alternate. <laughs> true, true. Um, but yeah, I just, it just was really hard, really depressing time, actually. And then, you know, it led to a few years of like, still trying to compete, but half-heartedly because in my, my mind, I was going to run the Olympics. And then I was, I've never officially announced a retirement, but I was like, I'm going to actually uh, like, I'm going to run in Rio. Colt will be able to remember it. And then I'm going to say, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm tired. I'm old, you know, it's like 38. Um, and I didn't get that. And then I kept trying to find a way to get that. And I just had to finally accept that I was never going to get that. Mm. It's so funny to see it. Cause you know, obviously, Again, from the fans point of view, you have this fantastic career. It's a beautiful career. Like so much happened in your time of running and your ups, your downs. It's just, it's been fun to be a fan. And you think about it's devastating, but I didn't realize sometimes in, in, in especially reading the book, how like you're going, like you don't think about, oh, she's going home now. She's with her husband and her family and there's a depression or, or a feeling of failure that you just don't imagine. You're just like, oh, yeah, she's fourth in the trial. She's pissed off. She's a little sad about the stuff that's going on. But it's Karagashi. She'll come back and race again, you know. But you don't think about how that person's going home and dealing with it with a family when they're not a runner anymore. They're just a person at home with their, their family. And I think the book kind of gave a little bit of a window into that side of stuff. And like in the beginning, I said kind of gave more of a 3d picture of an athlete. Um, I don't know if I have a question, <laughs> but I, I like your observation. Okay. I just, I, I just think it's fascinating for us because I mean, even when you see people on social media who aren't Kara Goucher that are just, you know, doing the thing and we show our highlights and stuff like that, you don't think about the, the backside of it. And I thought that this, book really showed uh, a full picture, which I appreciated. Now, it does get into some stuff that's really uncomfortable and really uh, like you can't imagine happening to someone in a professional environment or in, in a race environment. I mean, between the things that you're asked to do as far as taking like someone handing you a bottle of uh I forget what it was. It was some sort of thyroid medication or something. Cyanamel, um, yeah. Okay, yeah, that's the name. Um, it, to, to physical abuse, when you look back at this, do you does it taint your whole running career, or does it? Do you still feel like I did a lot of great things, and this this ugly part of it was part of it, but overall, I'm really happy with my career. You know, when I when I first knew my career was ending in 2016 into 2017, I, I was like, I never did anything. I never won a major. I never um, I never did anything. And I can't believe this is how it ends. I think writing the book and also having a child who is like obsessed with it all has helped me a lot because writing the book, I was like, well, I mean, I mean, my New York 2008 was pretty good, you know, like <laughs> it, it, it was, that actually was good. Yeah. And like, I was a really good half marathoner and, um, I didn't win Boston, but I came close. And so like, I think looking back, I feel like, oh yeah, I had a pretty good career, but it's taken me a lot of time because my initial reaction even now is like, nah, I never hit it when it mattered. But then I'm like, no, 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 that's not true. Like you always gave it your all. And, um, I think time, reflection of time. And, you know, that's part of the book is like the, the environment I was in was like you win or it's nothing. If you don't win, it's bad. And the only time I ever felt like pure, pure joy was when I won the medal in Osaka mm. because it was unexpected and we were all freaking out and it was like just pure, pure joy. But then that set this level of expectation that I felt like I could never live up to again. And so I looked at my performances as failures. But now that I'm in my mid-40s, I can look back and say, well, I mean, I did some cool things. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, you talk a, quite a bit about doping in the book. Um, do you feel like 
it's getting better in the sport in general, or do you think it's still just as prevalent as when you were competing? I think it's just as prevalent. I think there's always something new. I think people know how to beat the system. I would love to say it's getting better. I think, you know, I, in a weird way, all the Kenyan busts have been positive because it shows that there's actually testing going on and they're, and that they're actually catching people. So in that sense, I think we're, that's good. But, you know, they say like, I don't, I always miss do this. And Travis Tigart from USADA is going to call me. He's going to listen to this and say I'm wrong. But we took, there was like a, there was, I took part in it at the 2009 or 2011 world championships. We filled out a form anonymously if we had ever taken drugs, if we would ever want to. And it was like 60 to 70% had said they had, but yeah, we only catch 1% of people. So until that number is higher, like when someone gets busted, it's sad because you're like, well, how did that person get to that place? But it's also good because it means that the test is working. So and I, I just don't feel like we're catching enough people. Yeah. So I don't, but I don't want to be a downer because I feel like it could eventually change. And I feel like, like Kenya is actually popping people, which is huge because it's such a beloved sport in their country. So there's hope there. I'm just, I always have hope. Yeah. In, in her book, she states several times that Galen and Mo have never uh, said that <laughs> never they tested positive. <laughs> never tested positive. And never, never tested positive and have always denied. Yes. Yes. Just so we're all good on legal yeah. here. <laughs> Several <laughs> times in the book. I'm like, wow, we're getting a lot of disclaimers here. Yeah. So so the book went through, first we had it fact checked and then it went through legal. And so there were things that had to come out during legal because I had people who would anonymously support it, but they wouldn't like if it push came to shove, they were like, I can't have my name attached with it. But that was one of the things we did over and over to be sure, because that is the truth. Neither of them have ever had a positive test that I know of. And, and they both have vehemently denied it. So that has to be in there. And yeah, it's just basically covering my ass over and over again. Yeah. And now on our podcast, you're going to risk it all and give us every name that you think is doping right now. (laughs) I would definitely lose my job at NBC. (laughs) Let's, it'd take more than one hand, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yes. Sadly, yes. And there was actually a point when you thought that you might have inadvertently like been doping. Like you were worried that you were doing something wrong. Like explain to us that whole process and feeling. Yeah. So we would often get massages from Alberto and there would be testosterone cream just like right there. Like, Out. Just out in the open by the toast that I was about to toast for breakfast or by the bread, you know? So, um, when I started to think about stuff and after, when I went to USADA, I started to worry, like maybe I didn't do all of these things and I'm scared. And, um, I mean, like, I was like, I need to know, I need to know if I did or not. And I signed over all my medical records. I also was able to get a lot more medical records that they weren't, that weren't getting in the investigation and they went through it all and they were specifically looking for testosterone changes. Um, and it took a while and I was like, what am I going to do? What am I going to say to my family? No one's going to believe me that I say I didn't do this on purpose. Plus you're shaving I'll have now. have to get my metal back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my mustache, there's a lot going on. Your voice um, dropped. But yeah. <laughs> I swear I've never seen testosterone. Yeah, I have never. Yeah. <laughs> But fortunately, they went through everything and, you know, I even had a conversation with Travis about it. Like, I need to know and you need, if I need to ban, you need to ban me. And he was like, well, we would. That's actually what we do. And, you know, we've gone through all your records and everything, you know, you should sleep well at night. So that actually, for me, was a huge relief. Um, And that was used against me when I was testifying, which was always interesting to me. But I was worried, yes. Mm. So as a parent, You were talking a little bit about how maybe Salazar potentially used testosterone cream on his own kids to see where the limitation of um, being detectable might be. Well, that part's irrefutable, right? He's admitted to that. So as, as a parent, though, like that just seems nuts to me. Like I would never like I'd. Certainly, if I had to test it on a stranger or something like that, maybe I'd do it. But my own kids, I'm not doing it. 
but I think that that just is like like a little glimpse into into Alberto. Like he's like I, you know, he claims he wanted to know because he wanted in case someone ever rubbed it on you, how much would it take? I think we all, well, maybe we all can't, but I, the people that I know believe that's a really great story about how you find out how much testosterone you can rub into someone before you get a positive test. Um, There's got to be. But tests I think for that. that just. That or just, you know, like, don't use it. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> but then you don't get the advantage. <laughs> right, right. Um, I can't imagine testing something like that on my son, but they were adults. And um, oh, so yeah, these I'm weren't three or four year olds. Defend that. <laughs> they weren't. No, okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're right. like smearing it on a 13 year old or yeah. anything. Look at, they look were at both the changes. grown men. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it, it is kind of strange to me, though. Um, because before I read your book and before I really got involved in, in understanding, uh, Roberto Salazar, because honestly, he's not, he was a coach, but he wasn't somebody that I was necessarily like invested in or anything. I didn't really care. My thought was that perhaps this is just a man who wants to take it up to the edge. And so if, if this is illegal, yeah, we can still push up to the edge. And I was like, I'm sure justifying it to to myself, his behavior of like, because I want Nike to win. I want the athletes to win. I was like, this guy's just trying to get to that. Like all our shoes are 40 millimeters now. Nobody's dropping it down to, you know, 32 for their ratio. We're keeping it up at 40. Maybe there's a guy that just likes to go as close as he can to the edge, but still be legal. Reading your book, I got a different opinion. Can you talk about that at all, like where you feel that line is between being devious and being, you know, just kind of, I don't know what you'd even call that, but like trying to max out where you can go? Yeah, well, I I mean, people talk a lot about gray area and it's hard to set that line, right? Like people argue with me like, well, you think drugs should be banned, but do you take Advil? And I'm like, oh God, that <laughs> argument again. Let's go. Um, and I do take so Advil. It's, it's, <laughs> yeah, and I do. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it it's it's tough. Like I do think that Alberto initially was gray area. I think just what you said. He wanted to push up to the limit of what was possible, uh, but I think he lost his way. And I think we learned that through some of the leaks in the USADA case. Um, the fact that he literally handed me a prescription I did not have a prescription or need for. Uh, he went, he went over it. I do think originally he was just trying to be right at that level, but also knowing Alberto and the way he thinks and works, he thinks some rules are good and some rules are stupid. And so he thinks like an IV rule is stupid, or he thinks that a lot of things are just aren't that important, right? Like, so he's gonna always press to that edge. And if he goes over, he's like, well, it's a stupid rule anyway. Mm. Um, and so yeah, it's great. I, everybody likes to talk about gray area. And I just feel like it could be clean. Like if it's on the ban list or this or the uh, the way it's administered is on the ban list, like just don't do it. Yeah. How about that? Seems like a lot easier. <laughs> but that's I am wondering because obviously when you're at the level you are bonuses, money, fame, the works is on the line. And especially if you're coming from a smaller country or a country like Kenya where the cost of living is completely different than the U S and these, the prize money and everything kind of could distort your, I don't know, conscious, I guess. I, I, I don't know. Like yeah. where, the, like when you say blurring that gray area, do you feel like it is, you were working your butt off to do what you could do? Was there ever a time where you're like, oh, geez, if I could just get that extra little bit of an edge, is it, do you think that's an easy trap for someone to fall into at that level? I never felt that way because I always was just like, I want to see how far I can take my own body and wherever that is, it is. But I want to make sure that I do everything I can to find out where that is. And also I'm married to Adam Goucher who like has kicked someone off the track who he thought was doping. So like I, he would never go down that path. Right. And that's something for that I've had to like grapple with. Like if I didn't have Adam in my life, would I have done the infusions? Would I have done the other things? And um, I'm really glad that I wasn't put in that position. I think understanding why someone dopes is very, very complicated. And as you just said, I think it's different for uh, for different people, for different cultures. Like you said, in Kenya, you could set up your family for life by podiuming at a major. Like literally your your family is taken care of. 
And that's a very different, it's, I still think you, that's wrong and that you should be banned, but that's a different way of thinking about it and why that might happen versus like someone in the U.S. wanting to be famous or <clears throat> believing that they should be in the best. Um, I think that's part of why doping is interesting because it's like who decides to do it and why do they decide to do it? And there's usually a lot of very different cultural influences on why people decide to do it. I I understand when everything is on the line and, you know, for me, I had like a contract, but it had like very strict reductions. And I know of other Nike athletes that did things that they wish they hadn't, but they felt like they had to because they couldn't afford not to. And that's just a bad place for us to put athletes in. Yeah, your back's against the wall. Mm -hmm. So have, do you think it's possible to eat too many pork burritos and get <laughs> a, a, a false positive? <laughs> I do not, based on the science and the research that I've read. I do not believe that that's possible. All right. We'll keep you out of legal trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, God. I'm going to get sued after this. <laughs> yeah. We'll just start a, a burrito chain. <laughs> so obviously, writing this book, you had to sort of relive a lot of very uncomfortable you know, situations and events and stuff, but were there times that you got to relive that were amazing that you were excited to write about? And, Osaka. And maybe, <laughs> and maybe they didn't even get to make the book because they weren't as, I don't know. Dramatic? Yeah. Yeah. So the first draft of the book was a lot longer and it did have a lot more happy things, especially when I was younger and um, just like smaller races that I enjoyed along the way. And a lot of things had to be cut and condensed because they wanted it a certain amount of words. And it was like, is that really applicable to the overall story? So yeah, a lot of stuff was cut, but, um, wait, what was your question? Am I happy looking back? <laughs> like, um, were there, were there like moments of your life where you like loved writing about and sort of reliving? Yeah, I think Osaka was fun to relive and the great North run and running New York was exciting to relive. Um, even the Olympic trials in 2012, you know, were exciting, but you know, it just, it's part of an overall career, right? Yeah. I mean, no one is always on top and you just got to talk about the hard times along with the good times. Yeah. I want, I want to go back to one thing real quick. Did, now, did you have a psychology degree or was that only Des? Yes, I have one. I have a psychology. Me too. <laughs> That's three of us. Um, yeah. So this is more of a psychology question. So in your relationship in the book, especially, okay, so we go from your father passing away at a young age. Going to be traumatic for any kid, any time. But it opens the door, I feel like, to kind of explaining the relationship with Salazar and wanting maybe. Uh, so... Coming, I came from a divorced family. Uh, nobody passed away. But my mom had left and my sister, for a long time, I could see that she would cling to female role models because she need, wanted that, that place filled in her life. So I, I've seen that firsthand. So I'm reading your book or listening to it as you spoke to it. But, um, and I'm, I'm hearing that sort of in you. Like there's, you're looking for that, male role model that can fill the shoes of your father passing away. Unfortunately, your stepdad's he's gone, but it did, he didn't, you didn't paint a very fantastic picture. He was complicated. Yeah. He was a complicated man. Uh, and, and while there were times that were great with him, he definitely had anger issues. And so he, he and my mom got divorced. And even though it was the right choice, again, I felt, <clears throat> I felt like, well, I don't have anybody. I mean, he was better than nobody. You know, <laughs> he was there and he was at my events. And even though he would get angry, he still would support me in ways. And yeah, I, I for sure have always felt a little insecure. I think about that part of my life. My grandpa and I were extremely close, yeah. but he was my grandpa. Right. And so he he definitely was the most important male figure in my life, but he was a grandpa. He wasn't my dad. And so I think I always was sort of looking for someone to take that place. And I think that's why with Alberto, 
I just trusted him so much. And he, I mean, he would say like, I love you like a daughter. He would call my mom and say, I love her so much. I should, you know, God brought her into my life so that I could be a father figure to her. And Mm. so that was another piece of when it was time to leave. That was so hard for me because I, I finally had that. I finally had someone that I could talk to and someone that knew so much about me and someone that I like looked up to, but, but, but that person wasn't, there anymore Um, that was the crazy thing for me that was the watching and maybe you're right grooming is an intentional task i think that maybe in the way reading it it, he's a fucked up dude (laughs) and yeah and he has his own demons you know he he shared a lot of his relationship with his parents in childhood and he has his own his own sadness too. But I mean, I'm not going to excuse any of his behavior. I'm just saying people are complicated. Yeah. And, but I can't imagine not having affection and feeling affection towards him and now being very confused. Like, is is there any parts of you that still are like, no, I, I do love this about him or I do care about this. Like, it's not a black, like you said, there's a lot of binary like black or white issues and there's some gray. Is there any gray area for you with uh, Roberta Salazar? Yeah, definitely. I'm thankful for the things that he helped me achieve. There's a lot of really amazing, funny memories and good times where he was there for me and, or we were laughing. There's a lot like crazy things that happen on trips. Like there's a lot of really good memories there. That's what makes it really hard. And that's why leaving him was really hard. And that's why, testifying against him has been really hard because it wasn't all bad. You know, the bad was bad and it was bad, yeah. but there was a lot of good too. And that's been really hard for me. I think that's another reason why I never wanted to talk about this stuff because I felt like he, even though th- those things happened and even though I was violated, I, I, he also gave me good. So I don't want to ruin his life. I don't want to ruin his reputation. Um, but, but see, that's funny. Through th- that's funny you say that because you even bring that up in the book. You still felt guilty about things that he did and felt bad. You said, I don't want to ruin his life. I don't want to do this. He He's the one who did it. Right. Well, now you sound like my therapist. <laughs> 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 she was like, but he did those things. You didn't do those things, yeah. you know? And I'm like, ah, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. You're not it's ruining just- his life. You're just, you're exposing maybe some choices that he made and making them public. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think I'll, I'll, you know, I'll always, yeah, it's funny. I don't hate him. I don't. I think that he has some issues that he really needs to work on. Um, And I would really love it if he could come to me and tell me he's sorry. Uh, That's never going to happen, I'm sure. Uh, But I hope that he really works on himself because he hurt a lot of people. Yeah. Mm. That was that it was, that was the thing that I think re or going through the book it's such a complicated relationship. Like it really, like I wanted, like I said, when I went into the book, I wanted to assess who was right, who's wrong, who's, you know, you want to this. I mean, he doesn't come out looking great, but um, <laughs> you know, it, it was, it's not, it's very, it's, it's a very complicated story. Yeah, it's very complicated. Look, like before I was in therapy specifically for what happened between Alberto and I, I, I had already left him and I would have dreams where I would be like crying and telling him, I miss you. Oh. I mean, it's like so messed up. Um, and then I'd wake up and I'd be like, what the fuck, you know? But like, <laughs> I think that it's it's very hard. And I think that that's probably relatable to a lot of people. People aren't necessarily all good or all bad. And there was a lot of happiness and good times and but there was just like also a lot of bad times and darkness. So I had to leave. And then I felt like to protect other people, I had to share all the bad, but there was good. Um, There was. Yeah. I mean, there has to be also when you look at his relationship with some other athletes like Galen or uh, Jordan Hase and some of these people that uh, tend to like, uh, I almost feel like they're lost without him. Yeah. And that's how I felt. I felt like I, I, I wasn't anything without him. There wasn't an article written that didn't say care Goucher coached by Alberto Salazar. Um, and I felt like I, I, I have to have him. I mean, that's why 
leaving was so, so difficult and why it went back and forth. And if you read the book, there's like emails in there between us. It was so hard. It wasn't so easy as like, I'm out of here. Bye. See ya. Um, It was like, it was awful. And, and I, I think that when he really becomes your world, you do feel like you can't race without him. You can't compete without him. You can't be good without him. And I think I've, yeah, just as you said, I've seen that with other athletes as well. Wow. Do you want to move on to post book? Yeah. Or post Nike, I guess. <laughs> so it's pretty exciting. You, you've you been able, you've transferred now to two different, you worked with Skechers for a little while right after Nike. And now uh, you and Shanna have been known each other since Colorado, uh, since college, right? Well, she actually was friends with my sister. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, my younger sister and her ran together at CU. And she and I became friends when I moved back to Boulder in 2014. Okay. And she's working at Altra. And now you're yep. an ultra athlete. That's nice. Two yep. friends get to hang out together, <laughs> work together. Yes, we get... yes, it's been really fun. Yeah. And I noticed that they, I mean, they pretty much developed a shoe for you. Wasn't it the, was the Paradigm, uh, uh, Kara the... Goucher special? Well, they had, so it wasn't like the fours that Skechers, but it was like, they already had the Paradigm, but I, it was the only shoe that I really, really liked when I first signed with them. And then, and then they let me input on how to make it better. So I call sometimes I call it the Caradigm, but yeah, the <laughs> is, um, it's an amazing shoe and they have a lot of other amazing shoes, but you know, they were mostly trail focused before I joined. And so, uh, their trail shoes are amazing and they're running their road shoes have come so far it's been really exciting to see over the last because yeah. i guess i signed with them in 2019 so, so it's was that really before cool to see it. is it vf corp so right as i signed with them they were being bought by vf so the first year i was kind of just like what am i doing um but now they're in denver and so i can see them more often and it's been really fun to to be involved on the shoe side i'm guessing when you're at nike the structure was like your daily trainer Cause you need, yeah, you like, yeah. Okay. I was going to say stability. That's the only shoe I ran in. Yeah. Every once in a while I would run. I don't even know if they make it anymore. Every once in a while I'd run in the lunar glide. Oh, uh, I like the um, lunar glide. They don't Yeah. Make it I would anymore. run like an easy run. Oh, they don't. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I used to run on that for like easy days here and there, but really I was just a structure triax all the time person. All right. So yeah, man, that, that's a t- like you're talk about doping. That's a hard shoe to run in. <laughs> <laughs> you know? The structure triax? Yeah. That's a clunker. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Every... It is, but well, the shoes have gotten so different, yeah. but, um, like, it's like, I, I need that support. I had orthotics when I was younger. And so the structure triax helped me stay healthy. And then that's why the Forza developing that at, um, Skechers was so important because yeah. they needed like a supportive shoe. And that's what the paradigm is for ultra. So I know I am the clunker. I wear the old men's <laughs> shoes. I like that big, heavy supportive you, shoe. Like that, la- the medial posting. Um, what, what's yes, going on with the, um, uh, so when you hit the track and you're wearing spikes, those have no, uh, you know, control, uh, any type of stability, uh, components. Is it because you're up on your toes that it doesn't matter? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. And I mean, I, I guess so. Yeah. I'm just was going to say I only raced in spikes, but that's not true. I would work out in them all the time. Um, so I guess, it, yeah, but actually I'm not really a toe runner. I, it's really hard for me to get my calves sore. I like have no calves. <laughs> Next time you see me, look at my legs. They're like, there's just nothing there. And when we'll I was running for Jerry Schumacher, <laughs> yeah, he would be like, I want your calves to be sore tomorrow. And I was like, they won't be. I'll sprint as hard as you want me to, but they just won't be. Um, yeah, I have no calves. That's funny. See, I have no butt, but my calves are pretty decent. <laughs> Well, you get one or the other. Yeah. <laughs> I'm working with what I got. Um, yeah. So, and also, you know, we were just checking the podcast rankings the other day because we have a little podcast. Yeah. You guys are crushing you and Des. Like, yeah. Nobody asked Thanks. us. Right. And yeah, well, it reminds me of this kind of a conversation where it's just like super casual. We don't plan. We'll have like one topic and then we just riff on it. So it's been really fun. It's been super fun to get to know her better. She, of all the people I raced against, she never was disrespectful to me or rude to me or um, like when I kind of became a pariah, she would still talk to me. What's up, Kara? So I just, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like she wasn't hugging me or anything, yeah. but um, she was always just really like nice, like treated me like with respect. And yeah, we, we went out 
when was it? 2020 at the Olympic trials, we both stumbled into the hotel around midnight. We looked at each other and we were like, let's go drinking. It was already midnight. Nice. And that's sort of where our little relationship started. And it's been super fun to get to know her better through the podcast and uh, just talk about whatever we want to talk about. Yeah. I moved on after your book. I did one other book. I have like a uh, talk about power books right now. Uh, David Goggins, uh, uh, <laughs> What's his next book? The second one. I forget uh, the title. I went that one, then yours, and now I'm on Des. So uh, I'm getting... Good job. Uh, it, like, <laughs> if I can't run a sub three-hour marathon, it's my own fault. Um, I'm going to have to break my leg off with David Goggins, you know, start, avoid the testosterone cream with your book. And then Des is uh, starting off pretty fun. But uh, yeah, totally different style book. But you guys um, have been doing, like, it's interesting that you guys are sort of parallel and at the same time, like the trials 2016, she was running in that you guys have spent a lot of time together, but you're saying you weren't buddies like you are now. I just assumed that, uh, one that you guys, I didn't know that both of you were putting out books, but I was like, Oh, good timing for a podcast. And then, <laughs> um, and then too, that you, I just assumed that you guys somehow were, uh, buddies through running previously. Yeah. No, I mean, we would text each other here and there. We'd always wish each other luck. At, like if we were at the same race, she would make little funny snarky comments with me at the press conference. <laughs> Again, she was really nice to my family and she was nice to my son. And I didn't see that stuff. Like at the 2013 Boston Marathon, um, she was supposed to race, but she was injured. And she was talking to my family. And afterwards, they were like, we love Des Linden. You know? <laughs> so like she always was just nice, but she's not like super outgoing or anything. Yeah. Um, and I think it just took... That beer kind of made us start talking a little bit more. And then she was in Boulder last fall and we met up for coffee. We we're going to meet for like 30, 45 minutes. And then like a few hours later, I was like, shit, I have to go get my son. You know? <laughs> um, so it was just good. And, and we have very different ways we express ourselves and very different um, like musical tastes or whatever. But a lot of our core values are the same. And that's been really fun to find out. And we, our bodies couldn't be any more different. Like she's like 90 pounds and I'm like huge for a runner. So like we, there's a lot of differences, but, but our cores are very similar. Yeah. And I've, I have stood next to you when she says she's huge for, run you're not that bit. You're, you, <laughs> it, it, she, you're no Matumbo. Well, I'm five, eight, <laughs> I'm five, eight. And I always was taller and outweighed everyone, which was, I mean, whatever. My mom's like, well, it's easy to spot you. Um, <laughs> Des is like the more traditional, you know, she's tiny, tiny. Yeah. I, I've listened to your guys' podcast since it started coming out, and it's not it, what I expected at all. It's so much more, ca like, in a good way. Like, it's, it's casual but fun, and, it, like, it feels like you're hanging out with friends more than listening to a podcast. Yeah, thanks. That's what we want, right? So now that we have some sponsorship offers, and we just want to make sure that it stay always stays. Like, we don't want to have to put out a like a questionnaire of what we're going to go through because we just want it to be super, super real. And that's like the one thing we want to protect is keeping it as it is. Um, we don't want it to, we don't want to gloss it up. We yeah. don't want fancy cameras and whatever, right? We want to just talk. Like, here's what we're we're going to talk about today. Let's talk about it. So that's been our. Um, we made three episodes, not knowing if anyone would care. So we just like riffed off three, had someone edit it, um, and then put them out into the universe. And we were like, if people like it, we'll keep doing it. If they don't like it, well, we tried. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then we were like, oh my God, people are listening. So, so it was one of the sponsors, we, we Nike? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They've offered a lot. Let me tell you. They probably offer you to stop talking. <laughs> We will pay you to stop. Yeah, we've got a new contract yeah. for you. You know, you can get pregnant. You can do it. You can have kids. You just, can do whatever the hell you want. Just, just don't shut say up. Nice <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that'd be funny. All right. Have we taken up enough of her time? Yeah. Um, thanks so much, Kara, for coming on. We really appreciate it. Obviously, we're huge fans. And so this was very exciting for us. So we appreciate you coming on. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's the day fun. after the uh, 2016, like I said, we were running an event and Joni Benoit happened to be there. And I was like, Joni, you see what Kara did yesterday? She's like, no, nah, I wasn't watching. I said, oh boy, you're going to see it afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> great, 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 great. <laughs> Just, I know we're ending, but are you referring to my interview? Is that yes. What you're referring to? The, the, that Can interview. I tell you that that was used at every 
I have been through four hearings um, with Salazar or Nike, and they show it at every <laughs> hearing. And the very first one, his lawyer starts, I go, I know you're going to show the, the footage, just roll it. Yeah. And so he rolled it. And that's the first time I had ever seen it. They can do nothing to me anymore. And justice is coming. And I, letting go of that, people ask, like, how did you come back? Letting go of that shit right. is how I came back. I lost 200 pounds of fucking baggage I've been carrying around. And they can't touch me anymore. It means nothing. I don't, I don't care. Is it an extra kick in the gut that you got fourth and then Rupp is getting all the attention for winning? Oh my god, thank you. Did he win? I don't even know. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm not really surprised. I mean, I ran for Alberto for seven years. He does a heavy run if you're not ready. And, you know, hopefully he did it the right way. What about people who, like, a lot of people don't understand how you could be on the team and not be on something, but Rupp could be. How does that work? Yeah, I've heard people say, like, well, if she knew about all this, does that mean she was on it? Or, you know. That's fine for them to think that. I understand people think that. Funny thing is, do you think everything I know came out in the BBC documentary? No. And, you know, there's an investigation going on. I know people get tired. They're like, tell us what you know. Tell us what you know. But you know what? There will be a day. And I'm just going to be like, and I'm out. And I've done all I can do at this point. I believe in Travis, and I don't wish them ill will. The first time I went to Saudi, I said, all I want them to do is stop doing what they're doing. That's all I want. I know! Some other stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Are you good? Now, Osaka 2007. Honestly, and I was like, it's not that bad. <laughs> no, but there's two videos I love to rewatch of running, and one is, it's actually the perfect conditions for running. It's dry and it's light. You know which one I'm talking about? No. And then she's running down the street and slaps her head against the pavement. <laughs> oh. <laughs> the one in the snow. Okay, yeah. You, yeah. you must have seen that one, right? Yes, I've seen it. Yes, yes. Okay. So what's I can the watch, other one? This one? Yeah, I can watch those both <laughs> Me going on repeat. Up, po- I'm like popping ice like it's like, I don't know what it is. It's like popcorn. I'm chewing on ice. I'm like... I didn't remember anything about it. I just remembered that I swore. And I remember telling Heather, my coach, like, hey, just so you know, I think I just swore in that interview. And she's like, I don't care, you know. But I had never seen it. And at the very first um, hearing, the, they were like teeing it up, teeing it up. And I go, you, I know you're going to show it, show it. So then I was like sitting there like, oh, God, because I had never watched it. This is in 2018. So this is like two years later. And then I watched it and I was like, that's not that bad. No, but it, <laughs> what, it was, what it was, sho- <laughs> what was shocking about it was it was totally unfiltered, un, it was just like raw. And like you're expecting the, so how'd your race go? You know, I gave it my hardest. I followed my coach's plan. I worked the plan. You know, that's today's just a result. The other ladies are great. That's what you're expecting. I didn't to. say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's what you're expecting to hear. So that when you go, you know, ah, sh- you know, this, <laughs> and you're just like, Whoa, that's amazing. By the way, I ran yeah. my second fastest marathon that day. And I think I was all well, pumped job. up because of you. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, good. It helped someone. Again, your, your, your bad day is my good day. We're going to have to get I'm on the I'm so schedule. glad. All right. Yes, let's do that. Well, anyway, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Um, yeah, you've been a big part of like the reason I enjoy running. So I appreciate everything that you've done. This book is not, it, I kind of felt like it was one of those things that you say. Um, sometimes when you see a movie, you're like, I don't know if I want to see that movie again, but I'm glad I saw it and it was awesome. Uh, but it's because it's just so, it's a, it's a heavy topic. There's some heavy stuff in there. And, uh, but I, I really appreciate you bringing it out. I think it's probably going to help a lot of athletes moving forward. And I think it exposes some of the pitfalls that people could get into with joining a, a, a training program or, or trying to, as Matt Hart would say, win at all costs. But yeah. yeah, so for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you both. This has been fun. 